Hitler had 42 assassination attempts that were made on his life during his 12-year rule. However, we've only selected the most dramatic and interesting ones to cover, since there were simply too many of them. Nonetheless, no matter how meticulously planned each attempt was, they all failed. This left many to wonder whether Hitler was under some sort of divine protection. In 1932, Hitler and his officers went to the Kaiserhof Hotel in Berlin for a meal, but little did they know that death was lurking in the corners. A few hours after the meal, many of the officers were taken ill and had to be rushed to the hospital. Tests conducted showed that the officers were suffering from poisoning. Apparently, an unknown assassin had sneaked into the kitchen of the Kaiserhof Hotel and poisoned the meat in an attempt to kill Hitler. To everybody's surprise, Hitler was least affected by the poisoning. How was this possible? Well, he was technically a vegetarian at the time, and this meant he probably had some other dish. If only the assassin had done his homework well, he'd have known this and probably not missed his target. When the meat poisoning did not work, a military intervention would solve the problem of assassinating Hitler, right? At least, that was what Beppo Roma thought. He was a member of the Freikorps. The Freikorps were a private militia group that operated throughout Europe in the 18 and 1900s. Beppo Roma opposed the Nazi regime and vowed his intention to kill Hitler and oust the regime as an act of revenge for the event known as the Night of the Long Knives, which was a political execution operation by Hitler to put fear into anyone that would plan a coup. However, Beppo Roma's early plans were uncovered and ended before they even began, and he was thrown behind bars. Don't forget this guy, though. We'll come back to him later. The attacks on Hitler were increasing, and all his enemies were trying to cash in for a chance to claim his head. One of them was Helmut Hersch, a member of the national anti-Hitler group, the Black Front. Hersch was also a German Jew and a victim of the Nuremberg Laws, which prevented Jews from attending universities in Germany. This, coupled with other anti-Semitic laws, moved the young Hersch to join a conspiracy that attempted to kill Hitler and destroy the headquarters of the Nazi party. The Black Front, led by Otto Strasser, tasked Hersch to plant two bombs at the Nazi party headquarters in Nuremberg. However, a double agent among the Black Front revealed the details of the plan to the Gestapo, who then arrested Helmut Hersch before he could get hold of the bombs. Helmut Hersch was tried for his involvement in the plot to assassinate Hitler and was found guilty. He was then beheaded by the government as punishment for high treason. Hitler evidently took no chances with anything and certainly had his men everywhere to prevail against any chances of his death or rebellion. A couple of years down the line, after some more attempts that were avoided, Maurice Bovard, a Swiss-born student, was heavily influenced by Marcel Gerbohe, an anti-Nazi propagandist, and decided to make it his life's goal of killing Adolf Hitler. 22 years old at the time, Maurice traveled to Basel, where he purchased a semi-automatic pistol and then headed straight to carry out his deadly mission. Once he arrived in Germany, he inquired about how to personally meet Hitler, and a policeman informed him to get a letter of introduction from a respected foreign dignitary. The policeman had also advised him to go to Munich, where Hitler would be attending the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, also known as the Munich Putsch. Maurice followed the suggestions and posed himself as a member of the Swiss press with his gun concealed in his shirt and planned on shooting him as Hitler would walk by in the parade. However, as fate would have it, Hitler marched with many of his Nazi leaders, preventing Maurice from getting a clear shot, so he had to give up that opportunity since it was not his intention to murder other leaders. He then decided to go with Plan B, which was to get the introduction letter from a foreign dignitary. He forged the letter in the name of French nationalist leader Pierre Taitinger, which claimed that he, Maurice, possessed a second letter that was meant for Hitler's eyes only. He then travelled to Berchtesgaden, where he thought Hitler was, but the main man was still in Berlin. So he left Berchtesgaden for Berlin, but he discovered that Hitler had just left Berlin for Berchtesgaden. Maurice's travelling back and forth meant he had exhausted his money, and the only option was to stow away on a train heading back to Paris. However, he was arrested by the Gestapo for travelling without a ticket, and especially because he was a foreigner, and upon interrogation, 
he confessed his intention that he had wanted to kill Hitler. Well, you guessed it, he was eventually executed by guillotine by the age of 25 in Berlin's Plötzensee prison on the morning of 14th of May 1941. Maurice Bovard was not the only one to miss Hitler by a hair's breadth, as General Michal Karakshevich Tokarzewski also failed after having thought out a plan. After invading Poland in the Blitzkrieg, also known as the Lightning War, Hitler arranged to have a victory parade in Warsaw, the capital. Meanwhile, General Karakshevich Tokarzewski and some members of the Polish army prepared a deadly surprise for their conqueror. The army put together 500 kilograms of TNT and hid it under a ditch where Hitler and his procession would pass. On the day, the bomb detonators watched with excitement as Hitler inched closer to where the bomb was, but for some apparent reason, his parade was diverted at the last moment, missing the deadly surprise. Exactly a month later, Johann George Elsa, a German carpenter, took a page out of General Karakshevich Tokarzewski's playbook by planting a time bomb in a large beer hall where Hitler was scheduled to give a speech. The bomb was scheduled to go off at 9.20 p.m. during Hitler's speech to commemorate the beer hall. Hitler's speech was to start at 8 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. However, Hitler decided to speak for only an hour because he wanted to travel back to Berlin at 9.30 to have enough time to plan the imminent war against France. Thus, Hitler finished his speech around 9.07 p.m. 13 minutes before the bomb exploded and reportedly killed eight people with over 60 injured at the scene. Later, George Elsa was arrested and detained for five years and executed. Do you remember Beppo Roma, the guy who tried assassinating the Fuhrer but was arrested before the plot could unravel? Apparently, he was released after spending a few years at a concentration camp, but it seems like all of that just added to being a huge chip on his shoulder to conduct this assassination plot once again. Once he was out of jail, he joined the anti-Nazi group Solf Circle, and he was tasked to hire an assassin who would kill Hitler by gunshot or with a grenade. He began tracking Hitler's movement to carry out the fatal attack. But, aha, uh -huh, another Gestapo spy within the Solf Circle betrayed him and he was re-arrested, this time straight execution. A few months after a tank assassination attempt was foiled, Hitler made a stopover at the Army Group Center in Smolensk, Russia, to acquaint himself with the activities in the region. While there, a few attempts by Army generals were made in hopes of taking him out. First, Major George von Burslager, a Nazi officer, drew up a plan which involved killing Hitler on his way to the Army Group Center. He recruited several officers who lay in ambush waiting for Hitler's convoy to pass. Unfortunately for the assassins, the security of Hitler was tighter than they had expected, so they had no choice but to abandon the plot and activate Plan B. Plan B involved killing Hitler during lunchtime with the army officers. According to the plan, a signal would be given by Burslager, and the plan was then to have several officers stand up, point their pistols at Hitler, and empty their bullets into him. However, Hitler cancelled the lunch, forcing the group to activate Plan C. The third plan almost worked, but nature intervened. The assassins, led by officer Fabian von Schlarendorf, a member of the German resistance, handed two liquor bottles to one of the officers in Hitler's convoy to be given to a friend in Germany. However, the liquor bottles were actually time bombs disguised as bottles and scheduled to go off mid-air on their way from Smolensk to Germany. The receiving officer took the bombs and placed them in the hold of the plane, where it eventually iced up due to the extremely cold temperatures in the air, causing the detonator to fail, and just like that, another assassination attempt failed. However, the group didn't give up, and this time they were joined by Major General Gerstoff, who swore that he would finally eliminate Hitler and save Germany. He decided to take it on himself in this plan by strapping explosive devices to himself and setting them off once he got close to Hitler. Hitler was scheduled to inspect the captured Soviet weapons being stored in Berlin, and as a munitions expert, Major General Gerstoff was assigned to guide the Führer during his inspection. When the day came, a sweaty Gerstoff hid the explosive devices in his coat pockets, and as soon as Hitler entered the room, he set the bomb to explode after 10 minutes. He planned to embrace Hitler a few seconds before the bomb went off in an embrace of death. This time, it really seemed like the plan was going to work. However, Hitler quickly breezed through the exhibition and was out of the room before the 10 minutes were up. 
a now visibly nervous Gerstorf, rushed to the bathroom and defused the bomb in literally the last seconds before its explosion. And he heaved a sigh of relief. But what a story once again, as the main man somehow continued to swivel around these meticulously planned attempts. Gerstorf's failed suicide bombing attempt sparked a series of plans aimed at eliminating Hitler using the same modus operandi. This time, it was Major Axel von der Buscher who was recruited to perform the task. He had witnessed the massacre of more than 3,000 Jews, and that experience only fueled his hatred against Hitler. He was also willing to sacrifice his life. The military had just finished sewing new winter uniforms for the soldiers, and they wanted Hitler to inspect them and give his approval. Thus, Major Buscher, a tall, handsome Bavarian, was chosen to model the uniform for Hitler. Buscher then concealed a landmine in his back pocket and planned to detonate it once he got closer to Hitler. However, an Allied air raid on Berlin bombed a rail car containing the uniforms, forcing Hitler to cancel the viewing. Buscher had no choice but to desert his suicide attempt. The following year, Ewald von Kleist tried a similar plot, but the uniform inspection was once again cancelled. Of all the bomb plots, the one that came closest to killing Hitler was the July 20th incident, also known as Operation Valkyrie. Around the time, many military leaders and more than half of the German population believed Germany was going to lose the Second World War. However, Hitler wouldn't give up the war. Perhaps he was convinced that he would win, although the odds were heavily stacked against him. The military leadership felt that taking Hitler out was the only way to save Germany, while the citizenry thought that killing him will, at least, salvage the little reputation and morality Germany had. Whatever their reason, the German military appointed Klaus von Stauffenberg, a young military officer who made it his duty to take out Hitler and save Germany. Thus, Operation Valkyrie was put into motion. The operation involved Klaus von Stauffenberg placing a briefcase filled with two bombs in the Wolfschanze, also translated as Wolf's Lair, which was the war headquarters where Hitler and his top officers would be having a meeting. The conspirators thought that the meeting would take place in a concrete bunker at the Wolf's Lair, where there would be no windows but only a heavy steel door. According to their plan, the two bombs would kill everyone in the room since the concrete and the steel door would keep the blast inwards. However, on the day of the execution, the weather was extremely hot, so the meeting was moved from the concrete room to a wooden room with many windows, which meant that the effects of the blast would be significantly reduced. But this didn't deter Stauffenberg, and he went ahead with his plan because he thought that the two bombs would be enough to assassinate Hitler, regardless of the room they used. Stauffenberg arrived early for the meeting and went into a private chamber to arm the bombs under the pretext that he was going to change his shirt because he was sweating profusely. However, Stauffenberg was interrupted by a guard who kept constantly knocking at the door to inform him that Hitler had arrived and the meeting was underway. Therefore, Stauffenberg was only able to arm one bomb, reducing the potential effects of the two bombs by half. This meant that the other bomb had to be placed very close to Hitler in order to kill him. Pretending that he had hearing problems, Stauffenberg was allowed to sit close to Hitler with one person between them. He then placed the bomb briefcase under the conference table close to Hitler and moved out of the room pretending to have received a personal call. Another officer took his seat and with his leg unintentionally moved the bomb behind one of the strong legs of the conference table and away from Hitler. The bomb went off and three officers were killed with 20 others injured but Hitler escaped with a few scratches as the leg of the table shielded him from suffering the full impact of the bomb. Later, Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators were arrested and executed. This was the closest they ever got to assassinating Hitler over the years. Though we only mentioned a handful of assassination attempts, Hitler ultimately survived 42 officially recorded attempts on his life. The only person that could stop him turned out to be himself when he ended his own life in 1945 going out on his own terms. What do you make of the attempts on Hitler's life that we covered? Let us know in the comments section. Here's some more videos from our pages in history that you might want to watch. And that'll be all for today's Page in History.